Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> it's bright. Oh, not for you. Just, it's, just, it's just me. It's bright today. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, we're continuing our series, and I asked ChatGPT, anyone here have conversations with AI robots now? And remember when you thought that was just stuff for movies and not real life, and now you find yourself talking to robots? And uh, and so I asked ChatGPT to give me the main point from the world-famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, because I didn't have time to read this this week, and I read it before, but here's what the robots said. Uh, they said, one of the most important key points from How to Win Friends and Influence People by, by Dale Carnegie is the emphasis on understanding others' perspectives and showing genuine interest in them. Carnegie emphasizes the importance of empathy, listening, and understanding people's desires their needs, and their motivations. By genuinely caring about others and focusing on what they want, you can build strong, positive relationships and effectively influence them. This book highlights timeless principles of human interaction that are essential for success in both personal and professional life. Now, uh, I don't know about you, I watch this dumb show on Netflix called The Circle, and uh, it's like social media, and people are catfishing people, and you win money at the end, and this season on The Circle, there's an AI robot that people don't know is a robot, and so when I had the AI tell me this stuff, and I'm watching this dumb show, the AI robot is telling you how it's trying to be more human-like. And then we're continuing in our series on winning, and, and today we're going to talk about how to win with people, and so I thought I'd, I'd have a robot summarize this all-time famous book on winning influence people, and, and robots summarizing the thoughts of a human from a book are helpful, but today as we, we further this series on winning, how to win at life, and how to win with people, we're going to look at the Bible. Uh, because I think it has a little bit more wisdom than the artificial intelligence's summary of a book written by some guy. And also, the book says, this is just free for you, the book says, if you want honey, don't kick over beehives. So pretty solid advice. Uh, that, that's just free for you today. Nothing to do with getting influence with people, but if you don't want to get stung when you're getting some honey, don't kick the beehives over. So in searching uh, this week how to help you win with people, I found something. And, and so today I want to talk about a major reoccurring issue in the New Testament that Paul writes about and he addresses to multiple different churches in, in Rome and in Corinth. And, and so it's an issue that I'm certain that you have wrestled with for yourself. First Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1 says, now about food sacrifice to idols. <clears throat> we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Now I want you to remember this at the beginning, that, that knowledge puffs up, love builds up. Here's the issue in verse 10. It says, for if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? Now, I know that you have been wrestling with these two issues deeply in your life, right? The first one, Christians eating in temples of false gods. Um, you struggle with that one on a regular regular weekly basis when you come to church, you're like, I really hope he's preaching about my, my issue. No one knows about it, but, but just Christians eating at these false temples, really big struggle for us today. And, and then the second issue that goes in with this is buying meat at the market that has been used in offerings to false gods. Uh, so two things, you probably are thinking, I don't deal with that ever at all. How is that going to help me win with people. We'll get there. In Corinth and other Roman cities during this time, the temple functioned kind of like a restaurant at times. So friends would gather there. They would share meals there, similar to kind of our house church model. And this was something that was practiced by these people that Paul's writing to before conversion. So you maybe had some customs or practices that you did before you came to Jesus. This was something they normally did. They'd gather for meals at the temple and they'd eat together. And, 
And so the question was this. Now they come to Jesus and they're wrestling with this idea. If you believe there's only one true God, right? Okay, Jesus came, he died on the cross, he was God in the flesh. We believe in one God. And if we believe in one God, what harm is there in eating food sacrificed to fake gods? But if you were afraid to go into the temple, did it validate the false god's existence? A real dilemma that we've all struggled with. And and so here are the arguments for eating in the temple. I swear to you, it's going to come back around for how you can win with people. You're still wondering. Here was the argument for eating in the temple. We know that the gods are false. So it's okay to go in and eat these things. There's no harm in it. Their conscience allowed them to eat there without it being sinful. You have a conscience, don't you? You, you, you hear that voice speak to you at times. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23, says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. These believers were clinging to their rights and using their knowledge to willingly dine in pagan temples and eat sacrificed food. These were foods that were sacrificed to to demons or demonic fake gods. and, And they claimed, my faith is strong enough and it's okay. And so let me tell you how to not win with people. It's when you cling to your rights. It's when you say, it is my right to feel this way, to do this thing. And clinging to your rights, not how we win with people. It's selfishness. And and remember, maybe if you're here today and you know Jesus, remember when you first came to Jesus. Think back to whenever that was and you had no knowledge about who Jesus was or what's in the Bible or, or how do I live for Jesus, right? You, these are things you didn't know then. And, and how did you learn, once you came to Jesus, how to live for Jesus? Maybe you read the Bible, right? You, you started reading like, oh, this is what God says about who I should be, and you started to learn, you gained knowledge about it. Maybe you went to church, and you, you learned some practices, or you saw people do stuff, or, or you heard preaching, and you're like, okay, these are things I've heard now, and I'm, I'm going to try and live these things out. Maybe you had friends who, who were following Jesus, and they encouraged you or taught you some things, or other believers, and sometimes when you exercise your freedoms in the sight of others who don't have knowledge or faith or strength equal to yours now, we cause them to fall into sin. You know how not to win with people? Making them sin, causing them to fall into things that take them away from God. Now you're saying, Pastor, you said this is how to win, and you've only told us two things of how not to win. Here's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. The issue isn't just tripping up those who are weak, right? We want to win with people. We don't want to cause them to struggle and fail. It's the self-centeredness of clinging to our rights at the detriment of others. Remember at the beginning we said that knowledge puffs up. It makes you feel bigger than you are, but love builds up. It takes people from where they're at and makes them stronger. People are already looking to you because you're a follower of Christ. You might not know this, but if you know Jesus, you have something that a lost and dying world is in desperate need of. And and so just by the fact that you have Jesus, the Holy Spirit is with you everywhere you go, you have something that draws people to you. They're looking at you because you're a follower of Christ. There's something different about you because you're a follower of Christ. The power that rose Jesus from the grave is within you, and they need it. They just don't know it. You talk different. You live different. You think different. You are set apart. Now, I don't want to word it this way because I don't want you to get prideful. We, We don't want you to be selfish, but you're better than, not because of you, but because of him in you. 
And so a world that sees that in you, they, they, they need it, and so they want it, and they're drawn to you, and maybe they don't know why, and maybe you don't even know why, but it's because of Jesus. And so the first thing about winning with people is that you live differently for Christ, and that makes them want the thing that you have that they don't know is missing from their life. So you have to be different. Are you just like everybody else that you encounter? Are you just like everybody who doesn't know Jesus? Or are you transformed by Jesus so that you're set apart, so that people who don't have Jesus notice something about you? Winning with people requires them to desire what you have. Do they recognize that you even have something that they need? You want to win with people? Be different. Be like Jesus. Be set apart. Can you think of any issues in our world today where knowledge and personal preference have overpowered love for someone else? Every issue. Everything you read online, everything in the media, everything is trying to divide us and cause us to fight with other people. Whatever you're passionate about and the other person's passionate about the other side of it. And we have all this knowledge and we know all these things and we take our personal preferences and it overpowers the call for us to love everyone. Chapter 8, verse 10, for a few verses. If someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin... I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Now, Paul is writing that. I might still eat meat even if it would send you to hell. I'm going to be honest with you today. I don't know if I could, could do what Paul's saying here. No, of course not. I, I, I could guarantee you if the Lord or if you came and, and said, if you would never eat a steak again, I'd give my life to Jesus. I would never eat a steak again. Because it's a matter of personal conscience. And, and I live different. And, and thank God that he doesn't say that we can't eat steak so people can go to heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. My goodness. But we live different. There, I, I would be willing to give that up if, if I had to. And, and I want people to think there's something different about Pastor Sean. I want what he has. There's something, I don't know what it is, I can't put my finger on it, but, but there's something, and, and how do I figure out what that is? And, and then they see, like, oh, I saw him walk into that pagan idol restaurant, so it must be okay for me, too. People are watching you. Are they seeing Jesus in the way you live your life? Paul argues, I would give up my freedoms, the things I'm allowed to do, I won't do them by choice to help other people. We say instead, it's my God-given right. We cling to our rights. We say, I can do fill in the blank. Imagine Jesus hanging on the cross and instead of dying for your sins, clung to his right as God and said, you know, it's my God-given right as God to not be up here. I don't have to endure this. And he would have been right and he would have been just in hopping down or destroying everyone who was persecuting him. Are we supposed to be like ourselves and cling to our rights or be like Jesus? Your individuality destroys your relationships with other people. Your desire to need to win causes you to lose with people. Being like Jesus makes you win with other people. And so the second thing that you need to know of how to win with people is instead of needing to be right or exercising our freedoms, we're to love other people more than ourselves. Romans 10.10 says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. 
Uh, This quote from my study Bible I thought was really good, really challenging. It says, Christians who use their liberty and freedom of conscience to act in ways that might mislead, confuse, or cause others to violate their consciences are not acting in love. True Christian love concerns itself with what builds others up spiritually, whether that be in the things we do or the things we avoid. Back to this issue of meat sacrificed to idols. Romans chapter 14, uh, verse 15. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Vegans, it bothers me when you don't eat meat. (laughs) I'm distressed by it, and the Bible says if it's causing me distress, you have to eat meat. That's a bad way to weaponize the Bible against people. That's another good way to not win with people. But when I read it, and I thought like, oh, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I'm going to tell some vegans that it distresses me. Our attitude towards others tends to be, it's not my problem, what they think about what I do. My attitude sometimes is they shouldn't worry about me so much. They should focus on themselves. And most people are focused on themselves except for when they're criticizing you. And so the verse before this one, Paul says nothing is unclean in and of itself. And and then he tells us it's more important to do or not do things for the benefit of others over our own convictions. And sometimes we want to fight about being right, and we do that and we lose with people because of something that is our freedom of choice to do or not do. Paul's also going to write here um, that flat out eating in the pagan temples is a sin because the food is being offered to demons. So they're taking it and they're like offering it to false gods and it's, it's unclean. And this is the practice of this. It's something that you shouldn't participate in. And there are many things that are things that we should not participate in. And he also said, if you eat the meat you buy from the market, don't. But it's okay if you don't know, and so if you do, it can also be okay, unless there's someone who thinks it's wrong. Are you confused enough by what's going on? You're like, wait a minute, I didn't know that this meat temple idol stuff was even a problem. Now I'm confused about this problem I didn't even know that I should be worried about. And here's what I want you to understand, what Paul's getting at here. You have personal freedoms. There are things you can do. And if you want to win with people, sometimes you lay down the things you are allowed to do for others. We do things because we want to or we have the right to or we don't do things because we have the freedom not to do them. But the way of the gospel is laying down your life and your preferences. And so to win with people, number one, we said you have to be different. Live different. Be set apart. Number two, love others more than we love ourselves. So, man, I love steak, but I would give that up if if it would bring someone to Jesus. And then finally, the third thing is we sacrifice how we live to help others be transformed. When was the last time you willingly said, I'm going to put my desires to the side so that this person doesn't have a barrier to come to Jesus? Your freedoms belong to God. And God says, lay them down for others, like Jesus did with his life. I see and hear so many Christians today acting in a manner unfitting of a follower of Christ. Christians fighting with each other, destroying the church. And and, and I just wonder, like, what if we just focused on loving people and being like Jesus? Instead, they're focused on spreading hate, causing division, acting very unlike Christ, or being angry and and respond. Well, I have the right to be angry. Anyone ever thought that before, felt that before? You don't have to raise your hand. Mine's up. Um, Because I have the right. What they did, I'm justified. You ever thought that line before whatever comes, comes after it? 
That's how I only get righteous anger. It's always justified. Uh, I don't know why they're laughing in the front row. (laughs) But we have this need to be right more than, than we need to show love. And why isn't someone finding Jesus more important than doing what we want to do? It should be easy to say, I want to do that, but I'm not going to because I want these people to find Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, uh, moving back or forward into Corinthians again. Though I'm free and belong to no one, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. A slave to everyone. That means I will do what they need done. I will remove what they need removed so that they have the opportunity to find Jesus. We're supposed to be spiritual chameleons. You blend into the environment you're in, and if you're good at sales, you understand this. Uh, When I graduated high school, I got my general ed done here at Santa Rosa Junior College and uh, then transferred to Sacramento for Bible College. But while I went to the JC here, I worked down the street from the school at the Sears Parts and Service Center off Steel Lane. Uh, And did anyone remember? I don't think it's there anymore. Some of you have been there before. Great. I may have served you uh, 22 years ago when when I worked there. If you had a bad experience, it probably wasn't me. Uh, I can tell you this, uh, it was not a super lovely job. Most customers who came in had a bad issue. They were frustrated, they were upset, they were angry because they came in because they had a broken appliance, a broken lawnmower, a broken vacuum, a broken TV, a broken video camera, and definitely a broken spirit. Nobody came in full of life and joy, and so they came in with a problem. They had a broken whatever, and so they didn't come in jolly and cheery and full of life and kindness, and so you know about me, I am not handy. (laughs) I can't fix things. My dad was a carpenter and tried to teach me uh, uh, how to fix stuff and how to build stuff when I was a kid, and And he would just get angry and would yell, and so I would get angry, and so I said, I'm not going to do these things, I don't want to learn this stuff. And so fixing things was never something that I was into until I grew up, got married, had kids, bought houses, and was like, man, I wish I could fix all these things in this house. And so not handy college age Sean was a brand new Christian. Uh, My first year, two years of being a Christian is when I started this job. And and so brand new Christian Sean is working at the repair center at Sears. And keep in mind, uh, you brought your broken mower or vacuum in and you thought we were going to fix it there that day. (laughs) So you were already upset that it was broken, but when you came in, you thought you were going to leave happy until we told you, no, we are going to ship it out. And in 10 to 14 days, it will be back. Yeah, you're laughing. They were not ever, ever laughing when they found that out. And if that was you, you didn't like finding that out when you came in. You also sometimes came in to the parts and repair center thinking Sears, right? A craftsman products. I think we got a picture of, of tools, right? And you're like, you know what? I, I have craftsman products and they have a lifetime warranty no matter what. And the hand tools did. But when you thought your craftsman lawnmower had a permanent lifetime guarantee no matter what, and it was my job to tell you, hey, I got bad news for you. That warranty does not cover your lawnmower. The extended warranty that they sold you when you bought the mower that was like a third of the cost of the mower doesn't even cover the cost of a full replacement. But hey, I got good news for you. We'll take it and we'll send it out in in 10 to 14 days. If it's on time, you'll have it right back. All day, every day for two years. That was my interaction with everyone who came in. And then, are you getting the picture um, that this wasn't a happy place to work yet? And then you were sometimes a farmer 
who came in and you just needed parts to fix the thing for yourself because you, as a farmer, are handy and you know how to fix things. And you come in and you know everything about the thing that needs to be done. And some punk college kid who doesn't know anything compared to you, not them being prideful, the truth, like they knew everything compared to, to me uh, and they definitely knew everything. And then this kid tells you, uh, hey, I know you came in thinking that the part you needed was going to be in the store today, but it'll be about 10 to 14 days. <laughs> Let's order that part so, so that you can fix your mower. Well, let's just say most interactions I had didn't start off happy at that job. And sometimes, many times, oftentimes, they also left with the same broken spirit that they came in with. But I love the Lord. And I was a brand new Christian, and I was excited about learning all these things every week at church and in groups and, and reading the Bible everywhere I went those first two years. And, and when I want to, I can win someone over. And so I knew nothing about fixing things when they, like, it's not part of the interview. Uh, when they hire you at the parts and repair center, they don't say, can you fix anything? Do you know anything about fixing things? Because I would have said, no, this seems like a really bad fit for a job <laughs> for me. And, and I knew nothing about lawn and garden repair and home appliance repair and electronic equipment repair, but I listened to the customers and I fed them back what they said because they always thought they knew what they needed and we usually would arrive at a solution to what they needed to be helped at some point, 10 to 14 days later. <laughs> I only worked part-time uh, at this job, but I was routinely the top warranty sales associate. Keep in mind, I told you earlier, that same warranty that doesn't actually do a lot of the things you think it would do, I sold a ton of them because I got a commission on them. So like, you know what you need is a warranty so when your mower breaks, it will be taken care of 10 to 14 days later. When they incentivized laundry detergent, we had these five gallon buckets of powder detergent at Sears and the manager came in and said, you know what, we have the highest margin on this, the way to get our store to be the top store is we're just going to sell all this stuff. I'll give you guys one dollar for every bucket of detergent you sell. I sold, deter I didn't work at Sears Parts and Service, I was a laundry detergent salesman now. And so when you came in because your broken lawnmower needed new blades or, or some, you, like, you needed it to be repaired, you left with a tub of soap. Because when you want to, you can sell anything to someone. When you do the principles that endear you to other people, when you want to win with people, you can choose to. And at the time, there was something different about, I had the glow of Jesus about me. I had the fresh excitement of, of someone who'd recently had their whole life changed. And, and I, I cared about these customers and, and I loved others more than myself for the first time ever in my life. Like I came to Jesus and I just cared and wanted good things for other people. And, and I was there to serve the customer and most ended up leaving happy-ish because I served their needs. And they had a lifetime supply of laundry detergent and I had an extra dollar. And so we were all winners most days. I sacrificed my preferences to help them. My preference was, listen, I know you're upset, but I don't really care. I'm not able to change your, your situation today. Leave me alone. And you've gone to retail places who those are the attitudes of those people. Like, Aren't you supposed to care about me and help me? Like, do you remember when the customer was always right? Pre-COVID. <laughs> You're not right as the customer anymore. Like, the, the, the person working there can, you know what? How about I don't serve you your food at this restaurant and you can just go somewhere else? And they're like, okay with that now. Like, it's a very different world. And I knew that the customers needed me to tell them whatever it was they needed. And so I'd let them vent, I'd hear them out, 
I'd carefully guide them to what they needed so that they could tell me what they needed and they could be right. I didn't need to be right. I was a chameleon. The, the things that just blend into their environment. Like, I didn't need to know how to fix a lawnmower. I, I needed to know how to figure out how to help them get the solution they needed. And, and so we become all things to all people. Rebecca, if you want to come up. 1 Corinthians 9.22 I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may, I may share in its blessing. This verse, we become spiritual chameleons. We do what people need us to do to eliminate barriers for the outcome that we're desirous of which is them finding Jesus. That's how we win with people. We lay aside what we want to be. You might say, well, I want to be an iguana. I want to be a bearded dragon or a leopard gecko or a Komodo dragon, whatever your preferred reptile is. See, I want to be that. That's your preference. And there are places you can go in this world today and you can demand, this is what I am. Treat me like I am an iguana and they will treat you like you are an iguana. The Bible says we're chameleon. We, we blend in. We become the things around us so that by some possible means, some people will get saved. That's how we win with people. What area of your life have you created a hill to die on that's not worth dying on? There are some hills worth dying on. Listen, I'm not going to move from Jesus is the only way. That, that's okay. There are some non-negotiables, but there are many, many negotiables that are not salvation-centered that we die on and it causes other people to die eternally on. What knowledge or feeling do you possess that causes division? What preference is more important to you than someone being transformed by Jesus. We have Jiminy Cricket theology, to always let your conscience be your guide. Your conscience is an idiot sometimes. It makes you think stupid things. Am I, I'm the only one who does stupid things? Because I'm like, I thought that was a good idea. No, always let the scriptures be your guide. We have a guide. The Holy Spirit guides us. The scriptures bring us knowledge about who God is and, and how to be like Jesus. We don't need our conscience at all. We listen to the Lord. Lay down your conscience. Lay down your preference. Lay down your rights to win others. Do not cling to them if you want to win with people. And even if you are right, you don't need to be right. I'm preaching to myself today. Does anyone here like to be right? I, it feels so good. When you know someone is wrong, we do this thing. This is free. This is not in my notes. In our house, uh, every now and then, Amanda will say, that's so-and-so from this other thing that we've seen. And I will know without a shadow of a doubt, that is not who you think it is. And so we do a little wager system. So I'll bet you, every time I say, I'll bet you, I'm right. I have not lost when I say, I'll bet you to Amanda in these just fun little wagers that, that we do. I don't need to be right. But when I know I am, I'd like to extract value from it. <laughs> hey, what can I get if I'm wrong? Maybe I'm wrong every time. I want to cast some doubt. You know, you're probably right, but I'll take the other side of this just in case. You don't need to, I don't need to be right. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, I have the right to do anything you say. Not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, 
the good of others. When it comes to your conscience and your freedom in Christ, when it comes to how to win with people, we honor God first, and then we honor others above ourselves. It goes on to say, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. You want to win with people? Put your eyes on salvation for those who are lost first and lay down the rest. The thing that's most important is seeing lives transformed by Jesus. And so to recap for you, if you want to win with people, you have to be different. You have to be set apart. There needs to be some Jesus in you that makes you different from people who don't have Jesus. Number two, you have to love others more than yourselves, more than your preferences, more than your desires, more than stake. Number three, we sacrifice how we live so that others can be transformed. I can eat meat sacrificed to idols, but I would choose not to because it might cause someone else to struggle. And we win with people by being people of Jesus and putting their transformation ahead of how we feel and what we desire. Would you close your eyes, bow your heads? I want to pray for you. Worship team, you can come up. Lord, we're probably not struggling with the specific issue that Paul dealt with in this past, these passages today. But Lord, the idea behind it, the, the Christians who are choosing to do things because they wanted to at the detriment of others is something we all need to understand. And if we want to win with people, God, we need to, to lay down our lives. We need to lay down our hopes and our desires and our preferences. Instead, God, I think many times we struggle with trying to impose our will on the world around us. But God, you say lay it down so that some might find salvation. And so, Lord, for all of us across this room today, I pray that you would illuminate situations, that you would bring people to mind, even right now, God, where we've done damage because we've clung to our right to be right. Lord, we repent of stubbornness, of things that we've done that have harmed relationships or, or broken the opportunity to be Christ-like to someone, because we needed to be right, even when we were right. Lord, would you help us when, when it comes to winning with people to put your kingdom first, to put sharing the good news about who you are and what you've done first and foremost. God, would you help us to not indulge in the liberties we do have, but to be willing to say it's more important that I win someone to Christ than to cling to this freedom. Lord, would you help us to be slaves to you? You are our master. You love us. You died for us. The Bible's language is clear that we're to do what you have for us. Would you help us to journey to that place in life where we could lay down the things we prefer most if called upon? so that your kingdom could grow. Lord, we love you. We praise you. As we spend the next few minutes worshiping you, I just pray that you'd speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray.